in, uh, in Pam Bearfield Training Center. I'm Captain Keith Sescaliba, that's spelled K-E-I-T-H-C-Z-E-S-K-L-E-B-A, with the Hoover Police Department. Joining me at the podium today will be Hoover Mayor Frank Bracato, spelled B-R-O-C-A-T-O, and Hoover Police Chief Nick Derzis, spelled D-E-R-Z-I-S. You may also hear from Lieutenant Daniel Lowe, spelled L-O-W-E, of the Hoover Police Investigations Division. Mayor Bracato will make a brief opening statement, and then Chief Derzis will read a prepared statement. After Chief's statement is complete, there will be an opportunity to ask a few questions regarding this investigation. Keep in mind that this is still an ongoing investigation, so there may be some questions that we cannot answer. With that, I will turn it over to Mayor Bracato. Thank you and good afternoon for you all coming today. You know, six days ago, our community learned about the disappearance of Carly Russell, and it sent fear and pandemonium not just through our city, but uh, the entire state and the nation as well. The media quickly joined us to get the word out about Carly. Our community sprung into action, and they organized search parties, arranged prayer vigils, and they took other steps that I'm not even aware of to help in this situation. The Hoover Police Department quickly rallied multiple partner agencies, stopping at nothing to find Carly. I'd like to take this time to say thank you first to the Hoover Police Department, our partner agencies, our wonderful community, and to all those that aided in some way in connection with this situation. As the days have gone on and more information has been shared, we know everyone has questions. The Hoover Police Department is known for being very methodical and thorough with their investigations. For that reason, we did not feel comfortable speaking in detail publicly until now. It is important that we share this information now so that our community can be put at ease. So at this time, I'll turn the microphone over to Hoover Police Chief Nick Dursis. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank everyone for being here today. Besides me, stands the team who played a significant role in this investigation. I want to thank our department, members of surrounding local law enforcement agencies, the FBI, Secret Service, United States Marshals, and ALEA for their assistance in this case. We said from the evening of July 13th, our focus will be the safe return of Carly Russell. That occurred on Saturday, July 15th, approximately 49 hours after she called 911 and disappeared. From that point, our focus has been to determine Carly's whereabouts during that time and what exactly took place. Let me say up front, this investigation is not over. We're still working this case, and we've worked in this case until we uncover every piece of evidence that helps us account for the 49 hours that Carly Russell was missing. However, through the public interest, in some cases, public fear that this story has generated, we owe it to our citizens to tell them the facts that we have uncovered. So I will give you the facts that we know today. On July 13th, at approximately 8.20 p.m., Carly left work from a business at the summit. Surveillance video from her place of employment shows Carly concealed a dark-colored bathrobe, a roll of toilet paper, and other items belonging to the business prior to her departure. She ordered food from Tzatziki's at the Colonnade and traveled there. She then traveled to Target on 280, where she purchased some granola bars and cheeses. From there, she remained in the parking lot at that shopping center until 9.21 p.m. when she drove to I-459. Carly communicated on her cell phone with individuals known to her while on her path of travel up to the point of calling 911 at 9.34 p.m. And at this time, we will play the 911 call in its entirety. Reporting just got better. Hey, it's Dana from Streamer. I'm so excited to announce that local. Okay. 
Called a relative after speaking with the 911 operator. She went missing during that conversation sometime after 9 36 p.m. Traffic camera footage was obtained, which depicted this portion of the incident, and that footage was analyzed as part of the investigation in conjunction with the 911 call and cell phone data to accurately determine the time frame. Carly's 911 call remains the only report of a child on the interstate, despite numerous vehicles passing through the area at that time. No one has called to report that a child is missing, and the Hoover Police Department will not locate any evidence of a small child walking down the interstate. Data from Cardi's phone, including her Life 360 app, shows that she traveled approximately 600 yards in her vehicle while she was on the phone with 911, stating that she was following a child. 600 yards, that is six football fields straight, 600 yards. The Hoover 911 Center received a second call from Cardi's mother, stating that a relative was on the phone with her when they heard Cardi scream, and then they had an open phone line. Hoover police officers arrived on the scene within five minutes of being dispatched, and several other officers arrived shortly. They located Cardi's wig and cell phone in the grass near the vehicle. Her purse was located in the front seat of her vehicle with her Apple uh, watch in the purse. The food she ordered for Tzatziki's was also in the car. The items she purchased from Target, as well as the items taken from her place of employment, were not in the vehicle, nor were they located anywhere around the scene. Hoover police deployed all available assets from the point in the search for car. Additional resources were called in to include our own drone unit, crime scene investigators, and numerous detectives responded to the scene. Throughout the day Friday, Officers from surrounded local and federal agencies assisted Hoover police in the search for Carly Russell. Officers returned to the scene on 459 to conduct a thorough line search for evidence. K-9 teams from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department responded to check for any sign of Carly, the child that she claimed to see, and anything else that could be considered evidence in this case. Those searches all turned up empty. Private citizens, including search parties organized by our family, friends, began looking everywhere that they could find any trace. These searches took place throughout the day Friday, and again on Saturday, yielding nothing. At 10.44 p.m. on July 15th, 
The Hoover 911 center receives a call from Carter, the residence, stating that she returned home on foot. In subsequent investigations, detectives obtained surveillance footage of Carly walking down the sidewalk alone prior to arrival at a residence. She was conscious, conscious and speaking with paramedics when she was transported to UAB. Detectives were able to obtain a brief statement from her prior to being treated and released. During the statement, she told detectives that while traveling down the interstate, she saw a baby walking down the side of the road and called 911. She started when she got out of her vehicle to check on the child, a man came out of the trees and mumbled that he was checking on the baby. She claimed that the man then picked her up and she screamed. She stated he then made her go over a fence. She claims he then forced her into a car and the next thing she remembers is being in the trailer of an 18 wheeler. She stated that the male was with a female. However, she never saw the female only hearing her voice. She also told detectives she could hear a baby crying. It was the male had orange hair with a big bald spot on the back. She said she was able to escape the 18 wheeler and fled on foot, only to be captured again and was put in a car. She claimed she was then blindfolded but was not tied up because the captor said they did not want to leave impressions on her wrists. She said that they took her into a house and made her get undressed. She believes they took pictures of her but she does not remember them having any physical or sexual contact. She stated the next day she woke up and was fed cheese crackers by the female. She said the woman also played with her hair, but could not remember anything else. At some point, she was put back in a vehicle she claims was able to escape while it was in the West Hoover area. She told detectives she ran through lots of woods until she came out near her residence. During this interview, Detective noted that Carly had a small injury to her lip, and she claimed that her head was hurting. She also had a pair on her shirt. Detectives also noted that she had $107 cash in her right sock. Out of respect for Carly and her family, detectives did not press for additional information in this interview and made plans to speak with her in detail after giving her time to rest. Detectives continue analyzing data from Carly's cell phone that was left behind at the scene. We enlisted the help of the United States Secret Service in conducting this analysis. Part of what data includes several internet searches and the days leading up to their disappearance that I think are very relevant to this case. On July 11th at 7.30 a.m., the term, you have to pay for an Amber Alert was searched. On July 13th, at 1.03 a.m., the day of her disappearance, the term, how to take money from a register without being caught, was searched. On July 13th, at 2.13 a.m., the day of her disappearance, the term, Birmingham Bus Station, was searched. On July 13th, 2.35 a.m., a search for a one-way bus ticket from Birmingham to Nashville was conducted with a departure date of July 13th. On July 13th at 1210 p.m., a search for the movie Taken, a film about a production, was conducted. There were two searches related to Amber Alerts on a computer at Carly's place of employment, including one regarding the maximum age of an Amber Alert. There were other searches on Carly's phone that appeared to shed some light on her mindset, but out of respect for her privacy, we will not be releasing the content of those searches at this time. We've asked to interview Carly a second time, but have not been granted that request. As you can see, there are many questions left to be answered, but only Carly can provide those answers. What we can say is that we've been unable to verify most of Carly's initial statement made to investigators, and we have no reason to believe that there is a threat to the public safety related, related to this particular case. Thank you very much. With that, we'll open the floor for some questions. Please raise your hand and I'll call on you. Right now, our focus is to determine those 49 hours so the investigation continues. So to be perfectly honest with you, that hasn't even uh, in our mind or been discussed. All right, Joe. Y'all have heard 
what the police said regarding Carly, um, which is very unfortunate. Reminds me of Tawana Brawley and that whole fiasco. Um, unfortunately, you're probably going to go to jail. Your family, you're going to be charged a lot of crime, uh, a lot of fines you're going to incur with this stunt that you pulled. Um, I don't know what would make you think something so serious that you complained about would not bring the wrath down of the police force and every other force and people to come and look for you. I don't understand how you couldn't have that much forethought. You just the foresight to even see that what you were doing. I thought about Oprah Winfrey. Y'all probably said, what the hell Oprah got to do with this? Oprah said one time when she was little, she didn't want to wear no glasses. Okay? So what she did was she took the glasses. It's over those cat glasses that we had to wear in the uh, 60s. And most friends that I knew that had to wear glasses, they didn't like them either. Um, she took the glasses and she hid them, broke them, throw them away or something. And think that somebody had broken the house by overturning the furniture and, you know, making the house in disarray. And so when the police got there, they determined that the only thing was missing was Oprah's glasses. And so by this point, Oprah had feigned that she had had amnesia. And so when her mother was <laughs> when her mother was like, What happened? Um, she she was like, she said, What you say? And Oprah was like, I, I don't know. I can't remember. I don't know who I am. I can't remember where I'm at. And she said that the uh, the police, as they was writing this stuff down, Oprah's mother looked at her and Burley said, you know, you know how a black mama talk with their teeth clenched. And at that point, Oprah said, oh, I think my mind is coming back. And it was so obvious. Nobody broke in the house and stole those glasses. That's the only thing they wanted. This case was so bizarre. And we were so quick to and jump on it. But I guess the seriousness of it when somebody says that a baby is up on the highway, I mean, what do you expect? However, now it looks like it's a Jussie Smollett type of situation. And um, trust me, baby, you should be punished. If you did this because allegedly you were mad at your boyfriend but seeing a stripper and you put all those resources out for nothing when somebody else could have used them. I really don't want to hear no black and white stuff. I don't want to hear they only doing it because she black. I don't want to hear none of it. All I know is she should be arrested. But first she need to have some comprehensive mental health evaluation. She must have an evaluation because uh, that one it was pretty far. Oprah was a kid. And I think you expect kids to do crazy stuff like that. But a fully grown ass woman. Uh, uh. So with that being said. Y'all. Let me hear what y'all think about the young lady. I don't want to get too hard on her. Because um, you know that, that's definitely an emotional issue mental issue. But that don't stop y'all from telling me what y'all think. <laughs> Leave your comments below. If you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and share. What did your mama tell you about mine? Yeah. You know it wasn't polite to tell a white lie.
What did your daddy tell you, my life? 